storm will be my theme and glory. And that's true. But it ought to be our theme right now. Amen. You know, to tell people the old, old story that, you know, Jesus died on an old rugged cross and that never gets old. That he died for you and he died to save you from your sins. And man, that is the greatest news that anybody could ever hear. And so this morning I ask you to go to the book of Revelation. Surprise, surprise. It's Revelation chapter 3. We are in our sixth church. There are seven churches in chapter 2 and chapter 3 of the book of Revelation. Once again, I'll remind you, these are seven literal real churches in the area called Asia Minor, which is today modern Turkey. But all three, all, all seven of these churches are also pictures of church dispensation down through the years. And today we are in the church of Philadelphia. Now, it, it's not weird, but it's something that last week we were talking to the church of Sardis. And what the Lord says to the church of Sardis is that they were dead. He said, you got a name that you're alive. Everybody outside thinks you're alive. But Jesus says, I look inside and I know your works. And I know they're dead. Well, when we get to the Church of Philadelphia, it's known as the Faithful Church. It's a church where Jesus has absolutely no condemnation towards this church whatsoever. He doesn't tell them they need to repent of anything. He, when you read this church, it is a continuous praise that the Lord gives to this church. Now, what we can learn from that is that as we go through this study today of the book of uh, Revelation, we can all understand that we all have room for improvement. Amen. Every once, as an individual and as a church, we have room for improvement. And so as we read this, we'll find that a faithful church is the kind of church that the Lord will bless, the kind of church that the Lord will use. And my prayer, my deepest desire and my prayer is that we, as a church, would model the church of Philadelphia fall into the, mod, the, the mold that they have and live by it because God will bless us for it. Amen? Chapter 3, verse number 7, the Bible says, To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, shuts and no one opens. I know your works, See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it, for you have a little strength, and have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them to come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to pers persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Behold, hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. If you would, bow your heads in prayer. I ask Brother Leonard if you would lead us to the Lord in prayer, please, sir.
Now the angel, of course, is the messenger. The messenger is the pastor over the church of uh, Philadelphia. And the word Philadelphia, of course, means brotherly love. And that name really fit this church. As you study this church, you'll find several things that are really amazing. As you study these seven churches, five out of the seven churches, the Lord condemns, the Lord has rebuke. Five out of the seven churches, they're told to repent. The only two churches that he doesn't do that to is the Church of Philadelphia and the Church of Smyrna. The Church of Smyrna was a persecuted church that we studied earlier that was under extreme persecution. And he tells them just to hold on and hang out the best that you can and serve me. When you get to the Church of Philadelphia, there is absolutely nothing but great things that Jesus has to say about this church. Now, think about this. I do believe that we as individuals, we as Christians, when we stand before the Lord, we will give an account for ourselves. I will give an account for me, not for anyone else. You will give an account for you. But I also believe that I will give an account as the pastor of this church. I believe that I will give an account for what I preached and why I preached what I preached. I believe we as a church will give an account for us as a church and how we did for the Lord and what we did for the Lord. So with that in mind, wouldn't you like to be like the church in Philadelphia? Wouldn't you like to be the kind of church that God looks down from heaven and says, that's a church that I can use. That's a church that I can bless. That's a church that I can get involved in and help them to move and to get the gospel message out to a lost and dying world. That's what my desire is more than anything. You know, I've said it and I've said it and I've said it. I don't care to have a huge church. I don't want to be the pastor of some 2,000 plus people. I mean, I have no problem remembering y'all's names and y'all's birthdays. I have 2,000 that I have to remember, you know? And, and so I have no desire for that. But what I do have a desire for is being the pastor of a church that loves God, loves His Word, and wants to see the kingdom of God spread throughout the area to where, where we are. And so when you read this about this church, we see that Jesus has so many good things to say about it. I want us to look at why this church is a faithful church. And it's real simple, broken down into four basic subjects. The first thing is that it's the Christ of the church. When you read this and you see in verse number 7, he says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says, now this is Jesus speaking, and Jesus speaking of himself, he says, he who, had, who, who is holy. Now when you stop right there and realize that Jesus is holy, in the book of Isaiah chapter number 6, it refers to him as being holy, holy, holy. When you get a little further in the book of Revelation, and we get around that throne, you'll see that the, the, the angels that are surrounding the throne and praising God are saying, holy, holy, holy. And so Jesus is a thrice holy God. And the reason he is holy is because he is absolutely, positively perfect in every way, every form, every fashion. The Bible says that he walked in shoe leather, just like you and me. He was tempted, just like you and me, but yet without sin. And so when we realize that the Bible says that he was sinless, no guile was found in his mouth. The Bible says he was tempted every single way that you and I are ever tempted, but yet he did not sin. And so that makes him a holy Christ. But not only is he holy, but the Bible says he who is holy and he who is true. That word true there means genuine. It means trustworthy. It means honest. In other words, think about this. Do you know of anybody in your life Anybody that you work with, anybody in your family, do you know anybody who was genuinely trustworthy in every aspect of their life? Do you know anybody that 
verses to this church. Well, this is a quote from Isaiah 22, 22, where it says, God says, I will give him the key of David, and that they will be upon his shoulders. It goes from the same chapter of, of Isaiah chapter 6, where it talks about him being the governor, that he will put the government upon his shoulders. And it's speaking of Jesus. Now what that means is when you look at that, the word key, it's talking about the access and authority to several things. But I'll get to that in just a minute. But it's like this. And I don't have mine with me. But most of y'all probably have your car keys on you right now. Your car keys gives you access to your car. Ron's back right going like this. Put me to sleep, Ron. Don't do that. that, that those keys give you access. Those keys keep out those you don't want in, and it lets in those that you want to let in. It's the same thing for your homes. We have keys for our houses. When we go to our house, like right now, if you go to our house, the doors are locked. But when we get there, I have a key, and that key gives me access and authority to enter into that, into that house. Well, what the Bible is saying here is that Jesus has the key of David. It says he has all access and he has all authority. And I broke it down like this. He has access and he has authority that he opens the scriptures. Without the Holy Spirit abiding in you, which Jesus sent to us, you and I could not understand hardly any of the Bible. You can, I mean, I know I've had people to tell me that I've read the Bible and I've read the Bible and it doesn't make any sense. I just don't get it. The reason you just don't get it is because there's a lot had on the Word of God and until you accept Christ as your Savior and the Holy Spirit moves in and gives you the wisdom and knowledge and opens up your understanding of the things of God, you ain't going to get it. And so Jesus says, I have the access and I have the authority to be able to open it up to you, but I can also shut it to those who don't want to really know the truth. He doesn't only say that he has access and authority and the key of the scripture, but he has it of the gospel. In other words, it's Jesus that gives me as a minister the messages to preach. And you know, it, it sometimes, I've, honestly, I've been amazed sometimes where I'll study a message and think, who is this for? Not knowing. And you come in and you preach a message, and I'll, sometimes I'll have five, six, seven people walk up and say, that message was for me. I needed to hear that. See, God knew it all along. And so he opened up the gospel message for me to preach unto a lost and dying world and then those to a saved world who know Jesus as their Savior, but you're in need of something. The key of David, so he opens the scripture. He also opens up the church. He is the church. Jesus is the head of the church. He is the corner, the chief cornerstone. And in order for you to enter into the church, now I'm not talking about this building. I'm not talking about Middle Springs. I'm talking about the church of Jesus Christ. In order to be saved, in order to move into that church, he has to open the door. Nobody else can do it. The pastor can. I can open up the doors to, Middle, to this church, to Middle Springs, but I cannot open up the doors to heaven. Only Jesus Christ can do that. But he can also shut the doors. Same thing with hell. He can open up the, the doors of hell for those who don't believe. Who those, you know, people say, well, I'm such a sinner. I know I'm going to hell. You don't go to hell because you're a sinner. You go to hell because you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. If you don't accept Christ as your Savior, you will split hell wide open. And you say, well, but it's my sin that sends me there. No. What sends you there is your denial and your rejection and your refusal to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Because when you accept Him as your Lord and Savior, all your sin goes away. It's put under the blood. It is as, as far as the east is from the west. And so Jesus has the key to open and unlock, let you in or keep you out. Think about the ark. When Noah built the ark, the door was wide open during the whole building process. The door was wide open during the bringing of all the animals onto the ark. It was available for anybody and everybody to get into that ark. But once the ark was shut, the door was shut, the Bible says God shut them in. Noah didn't 
shut the door. God shut the door. And when God shut the door, nobody else could get into the ark. Don't you imagine that when it began to rain, when rain started falling out of the sky as Noah said it was going to and people laughed and mocked at him, when it started to rain, don't you know there was people running up to that ark trying to open that door, trying to get in, but they couldn't get in because God shut the door. And what God shuts, no man can open. And what he opens, no man can shut. And so that gives us, and you know, out of all of that, the, the great thing that we need to understand, the idea that we need to understand here is that Jesus is in the midst of the church. He is in our, if we as people of God, we as church members, would ever fully come to the realization that Jesus Christ is here. Amen. He is in our midst right now, watching us, listening to us, encouraging us, helping us. And if we're ever come to realization, he's here. It'll revolutionize your worship. You check. I mean, if, if Jesus come in and he scooted over next to you and started patting you on the hand and stuff. Now, I'm not talking about the preacher. I'm talking about Jesus. If Jesus ever did that, I guarantee you, you'd wake up. Amen. I guarantee you, you'd probably shake your head and might even raise a hand and might even, maybe, might even say, Amen, preacher. The thing is, he is here. He is in our midst. He's in the midst of this church. And so the Bible says he's got these keys and it gives him access and it gives him authority. And he knows, he knows what we do with the opportunities that he gives us. And he watches us. He's in our midst. So that is the Christ of the church. But let's look at the condition in verse 8, the second part of verse 8, the condition of the church. The Bible says in verse 8, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door. No one can shut it, for you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. I want you to look at the privilege that they enjoy. They enjoy the privilege because they're blessed of the Lord. As we read those verses, the Bible says he had given them an open door for ministry. In other words, he opened doors for them to be able to go out and to win men, women, boys, and girls to Jesus Christ. But I want to focus on something. I, I, I mean, I'm going away from my notes as I always do. But I want, I want to look at this part where he says, I set before you an open door and no one can shut it. Now, remember this. If God gives us a ministry, if God gives us a calling to do something, it's a God-given calling, a God-given ministry. Ain't nobody can stop it but God himself. Amen. And then it says this, for you have a little strength. I have taught the book of Revelation several times, three or four times in churches that I've been in. I have taught through the book of Revelation. I've taught through these seven churches and I've preached out of these seven churches. But I've always said that that might mean that they, were, they weren't strong, but they weren't weak. They were somewhere in the middle. But reading the history of the Church of Philadelphia, it was the smallest church of all seven churches mentioned in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. And what comes along with the small church is exactly the same thing. I, man, I thought, man, you could take out the word Philadelphia there and you could put Middle Springs. We have a little strength because we're a little church. We don't have big numbers. We don't have big budgets. Our ability to do is held back because not everybody has the ability to go out and to do. Not If I say, come on, let's go out and let's blitz our community for the Lord, there's some that just have not got the physical ability to go out and to walk up and down the street and knock on doors and tell people Jesus loves you. So we are just like this little church. They have a little strength. Now, what we see as being weak, what we see as being a small church. I mean, I had lunch, or no, I didn't have lunch. I, had, I, I got to meet uh, uh, Brother Danny Dobbins the other day. He pastor over Pleasant Hill. And I love Danny. Thank the world of Danny. He's one of my closest friends. He's been there for me, and I've been there for him. And uh, I, I was going to Walmart, I got a few things, and I was walking, and there he was. And we started talking. Man, we talked and talked and talked and talked and talked. And he was asking me, well, how's the church going? I said, well, it's going good. I said, we've had a couple saved, had a couple join the church. I said, God's blessed us. We're doing good. I said, 
you know, we don't run a whole lot of people, but I said, man, there's a good spirit there and all that. He said, oh, I know what you mean, brother. He said, we're barely making 300 on Sunday morning. <laughs> and I'm like, 300? You know? <laughs> and, but the thing is, folks, whether you run 300 or 30, exactly. you got problems. You got circumstances. You got, I tell you, he was telling me about his last Sunday. Had two services on Sunday morning. He goes and preaches one service. He gets a little rest time during the Sunday school hour. Then he preaches again. After he got done preaching, he had to go meet with a couple that was getting married in a week or two and counsel with them. After he got done with that, he had to go to a baptism that they had going on. After he got done with that, he had a meeting that afternoon and then a deacon's meeting later on and then church service at 6 o'clock. And I told him, I said, if I was you, I'd stand in the pulpit and tell him, y'all are working me to death. <laughs> and he is. He's had a heart attack. He's had all these physical problems. You ought to see the man. He's lost like 30 pounds since I saw him last. I thought he was going to blow away when I walked by the, the wind. I mean, you got problems whether you're a big church or a small church. And a lot of people will look at a church like that and say, well, man, they got this going on. And they got Awanas on Wednesday night. And they got this ministry that they do and their youth group is going here and doing that and they think that's a strong powerful church but you know what folks in the eyes of the Lord whether we're big in number or small in number it does not matter it's what we do with what God has given us to do that matters Amen. and if we will as a church body come together and realize yes we have some restrictions on what we can do in the ministry but we can do what God gives us to do to the best of our ability. Watch God pour his blessings out on it. And God, and you know, when we do what God calls us to do, it brings honor and glory to him. And when we bring honor and glory to him, he in turn comes to us and glorifies us in his sight. I mean, when I look at this church and I see what all that took place and all that went on, the condition of this church, they weren't the most popular. Because in their area where they lived, it was just like all these other churches that we studied. It was Satanism all around. It was devil worship. There was idol worship. There was all this stuff going on all around them. So they didn't have it, what you'd say, is easy. Because the Bible makes mention and says, in, uh, here in verse number 9, it says, Be, Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them to come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. Now, first of all, let me say, he didn't say that I will have them come worship you before your feet. He said, I'll have them come worship at your feet. In other words, he's going to make them that say they're of Jews and those who believe in Christ and they aren't, who are liars. He said, I'll make them come and they're going to bow down. In other words, Whatever the world says about you, whatever people point out and say, oh, you're this and you're that, let them say what they want to say. Because when it's all said and done, when the dust is settled, Jesus Christ will prove who is the real deal. He will point out those who stood for him, those who loved him, those who worshipped him, those who honored him. He will point that out. People can laugh and people can mock. And I... I'm telling you, we're living in a world today, folks, where I'm telling you, it's just a matter of time. You've heard me say it over and over and over again. It's just a matter of time. I don't know if y'all saw it. There was this guy on the news that they were shown this morning. Has him and his wife, and they had seven kids. And this guy is one, he, he believes he's all for these Planned Parenthoods, which we support. With the one in Elk, we support them because they give women an option from abortion. And it helps them to do the right thing biblically. That's what this guy does. The FBI came to his house with weapons drawn, pointing at him and his wife in the presence of their seven little kids and arrested him because they said that several months ago he had blocked access into an abortion clinic, which went to trial, was proven that he didn't, and the charges were all dropped. But the FBI come in, and you see what I'm trying to tell you. It's just a matter of time when you stand up for God and for the Word of God that it is going to come down from the top of our government that you are in. You don't like America? 
We're going to get you. You don't like abortion? We're going to get you. You better watch what you say. I'm here to tell you something, folks. This church lived in such a time, but they held fast to the Word of God. And they were not ashamed of God or the Bible or the, the death, burial, and resurrection. we got to be the same way. I don't care what the world says. God's Word is true. I will stand by it. I'll stand on it. And I will support Amen. it. I will preach it till the day breath leaves my body. God will bless a church like that. If we go to the, you know, there's so many worldly churches today. And when I say worldly churches, I mean churches that are going away from what God says and saying, well, we got to be friends with all the world in order to win the world. Yeah, you know, Paul says that we are to go to people who are different than us and that we are to witness to them and talk with them. But we don't partake of their sin. We don't approve of their sin, their sinfulness, and what they do. I can be friends with somebody who's an alcoholic. I can be friends with somebody who's a drug addict. I can be friends with somebody who has had an abortion. Or I can be friends with somebody that does all kinds of evil stuff. I can be your friend. I don't agree with what you do. I don't think what you did was right or what you're doing is right. But I can still love you in, in the... In the world that we live in, I can still love you. But we live in a world today that is intolerant. If you don't agree with me, you're wrong and I hate you. That's, I mean, if you're a liberal or if you're a conservative. Conservatives don't like liberals because of their, their beliefs. And liberals don't like conservatives because of our beliefs. And so we can't get along and we can't come to a table and say, well, look, here's why I believe what I believe. We can't talk about it. We just hate each other. And people are shooting each other and killing each other and burning people's buildings down and doing all this stuff. And we've got to understand that we are born again Bible-believing Christians and we must stand on the Word of God no matter what the President or Congress or Senate says. Amen. That's why God blessed this church. That's why this church was known to be faithful because he said at the end of verse 8, you kept my word and have not denied my name. In other words, when push comes to shove, they said, we ain't backing up. We might be a small little church. We may not be big in number. But I'm going to tell you, we are going to stand on the authority of God's word. That's the condition of the church. And I've already kind of mentioned the next one is the challenges of the church. And that's the fact that they, people didn't like them. People didn't care for them. The church history says they were oppressed. Church history tells us as we look into the church of Philadelphia that not only were they oppressed, but they were attacked. They were hated. Many times in, in situations like this, if you proclaimed to be a Christian, you couldn't buy or sell. They wouldn't let you buy anything in their markets. They wouldn't let you sell anything in their markets. You were in bad shape. But these people didn't care. They cared more about serving God and being in the right in God's eyes than they did anything else. Oh, how I wish the modern church today would be like that. Amen. Now I want to get to the last part, the comfort of the church. He tells them in verse 12, 13, He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Now, let me explain that real quick. It tells us in his church history that in the church of Philadelphia, there was all these Greek temples that they had. These temples to foreign gods. And when you as a individual, you as a citizen of Philadelphia did something outstanding, gave to something that was in need that they thought was a great deal, they would put a column up with your name on it. And that way everybody would walk by and see your name and say, oh, what a good person he is. Well, here's what Jesus says to he said, he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. In other words, what he's talking about here is the security and the stability of a believer in Christ. That if we'll serve him and love him and do what he asks us to do and what he tells us to do, he said, I will give you the stability of a pillar. That you will be in my Father's temple, in the kingdom of heaven, for all eternity. The reason he says the words in verse number 10, and I also will keep, uh, uh, go back, verse 11, or verse 12, excuse me. I will make him a pillar of the 
Jehovah my God, and he shall go out no more. It tells us that there was a volcano very close to the city of Philadelphia. And every time that volcano would rumble, everybody evacuated. They'd leave the city, go away. Well, God, through Jesus Christ here, is saying that when you get to your eternal home in heaven, there'll be no going in and going out. You'll not have to run. You'll not have to fear because you will have perfect safety, perfect security. Everything will be at peace when you get home. We live in a world today where there ain't a lot of peace. Man, then here uh, hurricanes getting ready to hit in Florida. And by the way, they say it's going to come right up the coast, right towards us, somewhere around us. We're going to get wet towards the end of the week. And people get all woo about that. We know that there's all kinds of things going on in this world today that can cause you and me to fear and to be scared. But I'll tell you something. If you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and your Savior, you put your faith and your trust in Him and Him alone. I do not put it in the government. I do not put it in the authorities that are over us. I put all my trust and all my faith in God and His Word and what He says will take place. I may not have it made here, but when I get to heaven, praise God, it's going to be glorious. I will be secure. I will be stable. I'll be at peace forevermore. That's some comfort. And then he goes on to say not only that, but he says, I will write on him the name of my God. And the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven, and my God, and I will write on him my name, my new name. In other words, Jesus has taken ownership of you. He's saying, you will be in the presence of God forever and ever. And God loves you. And the Bible says, God said, I will not be ashamed of you. He so, goes so far to say that I'm not ashamed of you that he says, I will put my name on you. I, I, I've heard some people say, does that mean I'm getting a tattoo when I get to heaven? I don't know what it means. But all I know that it means is that Jesus Christ is going to look at me and say, you belong to me. And he's going to secure me with his name in heaven and with the name of God and with the name of the new Jerusalem. Folks, when we get there, there'll be no more heartaches and pain. There'll be no more worries whatsoever for all eternity. No sadness, no sorrow, no death, no dying, no crying, no disease, no heartache, no COVID-19, no nothing to worry about anymore. Won't it be wonderful there? Amen? Friends, this is the kind of church that God uses. It is. And if we want to be a church that God uses, we need to fall into the mold of the church of Philadelphia. It's my prayer. I'm, I'm going to, in a moment, I'm going to bow down in this altar. And I'm going to ask God to help me as an individual, first of all, me as an individual, to be more like the church of Philadelphia. And then I'm going to ask him to help us as a church to fall into the mold of the church of Philadelphia. And what I'm saying is I want God to work in your heart and in my heart to help us be more like this church dedicated, devoted to Him. That we will say, no matter what comes in this world, we will put you first. I've said it throughout the years and I'd love to say it again. It's where you take Jesus Christ and you put Him on the mantle of your heart. Because if you're a grandma or you're a grandpa here, I guarantee you you've got a picture of your grandbabies on the mantle. If you've got a mantle over the fireplace, there are pictures hanging there. It is in the most obvious place in your home. When you walk in, there they are. That's what I want Jesus to be. I want him to be on the mantle of my heart. I want him to be first and foremost in everything that I say and do at home and in the house of God. And I want to see this church be a church that God uses for his glory and his honor. 
We live in a dark world to where things are black and dark outside. And it's time to let the light of Jesus Christ shine from within this church that he's given us. Whether we're big or whether we're small, let's hold on to the little strength that we have and use it for the glorification of Jesus Christ. Would you stand your feet, please?